This is our third video in our series on Chapter 2 on aqueous chemistry. In this video we'll be looking at some other bonds that are present in biological systems as well as water's interesting properties as a solvent. Let's consider first of all the relative strengths of the bonds that we've looked at thus far. Remember these are intermolecular bonds, that is the bonds between separate molecules. This is a figure from your book and you can see the bond strength is given in kilojoules per mole here in our uh, y-axis on the left. Let's consider them though in a comparative way. We're going to take a hydrogen bond as our starting point. If you look to the left you'll see an ionic bond is about five times as strong as that hydrogen bond and a covalent bond is 23 times as strong. So comparing these three the covalent bond is definitely our heavy lifter. There's one more type of bonding interaction we haven't considered, and that's the van der Waals interactions. As in our illustration here, it is 1 20th the strength of a hydrogen bond. That means it's 500 times weaker than a covalent bond. So compared to our heavy lifter, this guy's pretty weak. When we consider the cell and the fact that you have multiple structures that are interconnecting together and that needs to be a very stable environment, we might think the strongest interactions were the most important. What we find, however, is most of the actual architecture of the cell is made up by these weaker interactions. At first that might seem odd, but when we consider it more carefully, it's very logical. In this type of an environment, remember, the cellular environment is very dynamic. Molecules need to interact with each other, they need to be able to break and reform those bonds repeatedly, and for that purpose the weaker bonds will be more easily broken and reformed. So let's look at these van der Waals forces. These are the weakest of the forces we've considered thus far. There are actually two types. The first is the dipole-dipole interactions. This is an interaction between two polar groups, like our carbonyl groups here. In the bond between carbon and oxygen, there's an unequal sharing of those electrons in the bond because oxygen is more electronegative. So it carries a partial negative dipole and the carbon a partial positive dipole. So those dipoles can align to form this dipole-dipole interaction. Notice in this case there are permanent dipoles present in the molecules. The weakest of the weak interactions, so to speak, is the London dispersion forces. This is the interaction between nonpolar molecules, and we'll actually see this occurs very commonly. It results from small fluctuations in electron distribution rather than a permanent dipole. In the example here, we have two methyl groups interacting with each other. You'll notice that there's a partial negative dipole in the carbon on the left and a partial positive dipole in the carbon on the right, even though the groups are identical. This is because that carbon-hydrogen bond, within that bond, the electrons are pretty evenly distributed, but they can fluctuate in one direction or another, and so a very small, very transient interaction. Now individually, these London dispersion forces and the dipole-dipole interactions are individually very small, but it can have a cumulative effect. The best example I can think of is a zipper. If we have only a couple of teeth in that zipper, it becomes very weak and very easily separated. However, the more teeth we have in the zipper, that is to say the longer the zipper, the stronger the effect. We'll see this very commonly and it is in fact the source of the strength of human hair as well as the primary source of the stability of the DNA double helix. So let's look at another of water's interesting properties as a dielectric. That is its ability to solvate ions. It prevents them from interacting with each other. In the example here we have sodium and chloride ions. They're solvated or coated with water molecules and because of that they're separated or isolated from one another. In other words the sodium and the chloride ions have a stronger attraction for water than they do for themselves. This is a gives us an illustration of the wa of water as an insulator of charge. We can actually put a quantitative measure on that and we refer to that as the dielectric constant. Here's a table from your book giving some of the dielectric constants for several solvents. 
You'll notice water's at the top of the list here, very high dielectric constant. The higher this value, the better it is as an insulator of charge. Now I'll never ask you to memorize a table from your book, but let's notice the trend. So here's formamide at the top, highest dielectric constant in our table, and here's benzene at the bottom, a very low dielectric constant. Let's consider those molecules. Here's formamide at the top. We have an amide group, a very polar molecule, and here's benzene at the bottom, a very nonpolar molecule. So you see that the dielectric constant, the higher that value, the better it insulates charge, the more polar the molecule. So the high dielectric constant of water means that it solvates very well, it hydrates very well. Now as we saw in our table in the previous slide, other solvents can do the same thing. In that case we call it solvation, in the case of water we call it hydration. Just a difference in terminology there. So in our figure here we have a baryon ion being hydrated with water and a chloride ion being solvated with methanol. Just a reminder that even though we say the cell's environment is aqueous, it's not watery. Here's a figure from your book that gives us a pretty good idea of everything that's inside the cell. You can see actin filaments in red, you can see ribosomes in green, you can see it's a very thick, viscous molecular stew. So even though it's aqueous, it's not watery and thin. In our next video, we're going to look at the hydrophobic effect, and what we'll see is that the ability of water to repel substances is, as, is equally important as its ability to attract them. And it is this effect that drives the association of biological molecules so that we can form individual cells.